Hi, my name is Ryan Pierce. Today I'll be presenting Kotlin flows and channels for Android. Flows and channels are features within the Kotlin coroutines library. I'll be discussing them as well as how you can apply them to your Android development. Again, my name is Ryan Pierce. I'm a mobile app developer. I'm currently an Android developer at Capital One, and a fun fact is that I'm also an aerospace engineer. So instead of starting off by explaining what flows and channels are, I think it might be more meaningful to go into what challenges we face in Android development and how flows and channels can help us approach these challenges. One of the biggest aspects of Android development is dealing with asynchrony, whether it be network calls or database reads. Dealing with asynchrony, we encounter many issues. One of them is race conditions, probably one of the most common issues. Back pressure, if we're dealing with a streaming application. Leaked resources. And if we're using threads, we may find that they're very expensive. They can starve each other deadlocks can occur between them, and several other challenges that come with asynchrony. Now, one of the underlying issues that can cause these problems is this thing called shared mutable state. And I'll describe it in the words of a famous computer scientist named Tony Hoar. Tony Hoar actually came up with one of the more popular implementations of quicksort. But in his paper, Communicating Sequential Processes from 1978, he stated, a widely adopted method of communication is by inspection and updating of a common store. So this common store might be a list in memory or a file on disk. However, this can create severe problems in the construction of correct programs, and it may lead to expense and unreliability, like glitches. So what he's describing is basically the issues that we discussed in the last slide. But to solve this, while his paper goes into that solution, the engineers behind the Go language created a proverb to describe the solution. Do not communicate by sharing memory. Instead, share memory by communicating. So the way this was implemented in Kotlin was through the coroutines library with coroutines and channels. Now coroutines are the backbone behind how you use channels and how flows are built. So it's really important that we understand the fundamentals of how they work. I'm sure many of you have probably used them and understand them pretty deeply, but I want to go into why coroutines are so incredibly powerful. Normally, people will describe coroutines as a prettier callback. So a typical callback might be a function where we pass a functional type like onCompletion so that when we asynchronously retrieve values, since we can't return a value, we can at least do something with it, specifically pass it to the functional type like onCompletion so that it can go and do something. When we call it in the UI, we have to pass a trailing lambda with that on completion implementation, in this case print, so we can do something with that result. But with coroutines, we use suspending functions. And because of how they're implemented, suspending functions can return their return types despite the fact that they can perform asynchronous operations. And that's one of their real superpowers. So we can, to use them, launch a coroutine call get value, which is a suspending function, get a result, and do something with that result. We can even pass that result to another suspending function so we can use it and print the second result instead. So we create these very sequential asynchronous processes that look very nice, and that's where you get the prettier callback. However, if I were to just say that coroutines were prettier callbacks, I'd be doing them a massive injustice. Coroutines actually have this superpower, and it's called suspension. Basically, the coroutines can suspend. Now, when I first heard this, I didn't really understand what it means. Another way to think about this is that coroutines can pause, like hitting the pause button. When coroutines are being run by a thread, they have the ability to stop and resume later so that the thread can operate on some other asynchronous process, specifically another coroutine. And it does so by choosing to suspend at various suspension points within a coroutine. So the way that this looks is we might have two coroutines running concurrently, but what will happen is we might be able to see one coroutine suspend, allowing another coroutine to resume, and that way the thread can switch between the two, allowing the suspending functions of each coroutine to sort of interweave. Now, what if we want to use state in between coroutines? We want coroutines to operate on some sort of changing state. Again, we want to avoid shared mutable state. And one of the ways we can do that is to communicate between coroutines using these things called channels. Channels are like a pipe. 
You can send information into them and receive information from them. They're like synchronization primitives, taking information in and spitting them out. Specifically, channels are like non-blocking queues. They have suspending functions to send information into the channel and suspending functions to receive information from the channel. So let's look at a very basic example of how channels work. First, let's create a channel of integers represented by a green pipe on the right. Then we'll launch a coroutine, coroutine number one, and this coroutine will receive values from the channel, and it will do so using a for loop. Then we'll create coroutine number two, and this coroutine is identical to coroutine number one. It will receive values from the channel using a for loop. Lastly, we'll launch a third and final coroutine, and this coroutine is responsible for producing values that will be sent into the channel. Specifically, we'll take a list of one, two, three, and four, and for each value, we will send it into the channel. So this is how it's gonna work. As the producing coroutine sends the first value into the channel, specifically value number one, as coroutine number one and two are available, one of them will receive that first value. In this case, it'll be coroutine number one using the for loop iterating over the channel. If another coroutine is available, like coroutine number two, it will also receive the next value, specifically value number two. As coroutine one and two are processing their first values, the way that this reacts is coroutine number three will suspend. Once coroutines number one or two are available, coroutine three, the producing coroutine, can continue to send values into the channel until it has finished iterating over the list. Once it has finished iterating, it can close the channel. Another way that we can write this is using the produce builder, except that we don't have to reference the channel inside the builder, and we don't have to explicitly close the channel. But the takeaway here is that in our producing coroutine, we have this list of numbers that we want to send to some other part of our application. And it's only contained within our coroutine number three, so it isn't shared between any other resources. When we want to share that information, we do so by communicating, and we use the channel to do that. Channels behave like non-blocking queues. They're synchronization primitives that allow us to safely send values across our application. Now, sometimes channels are used as streaming mechanisms. And while depending on the implementation, they can work that way, they may not be as safe, as performant, or even as ergonomic as other streaming tools that we might be able to use. This brings us to GitHub issue number 254 in the Kotlin Coroutines library. Channels are hot. They consume resources before anything has received the first value from that channel. So they're somewhat inefficient. They're also not as safe or as easy to use as other types of tools. So the engineers needed an abstraction for cold streams that was lazy and computed data in a push mode. They wanted something that was safer and easier for processing streams. That very GitHub issue inspired the idea of creating a tool called Flow. Now Flow is usually depicted with a faucet of running water or a waterfall, but I like to depict it with someone in disguise. And the reason why is you will see how versatile Flow is. Sometimes Flow is described as a factory function or an abstraction for different streaming tools. And that's really one I wanna drill into, how versatile and flexible Flow is for handling different types of streams. So let's go through a very basic example of how flows work. So we'll start with a flow of numbers. We're gonna use a flow builder to create that flow of numbers. And this square tube is gonna represent our flow. We're gonna use a list of one, two, three and iterate through that list of numbers and emit each number. Now, as you notice from this square tube, it is light gray and sort of transparent. And what that represents is this flow is inactive. It only exists right now as a variable. It is not consuming any resources while it just sits there declared as a flow. Now let's continue. We'll launch a coroutine. We'll reference the flow numbers and we'll call collect. As you can see on the right, our square tube turned bright blue, representing it turning on. 
And the reason why is because we called this thing called collect, which is a terminal operator. And what that means is flows actually don't start or start consuming resources until you've called a terminal operator. Below our square tube that we initially had is another one to represent the flow collector. And they act in tandem to have a flow produce and collect values as the flow is streaming. So we have a flow of numbers now that we're collecting and we're gonna use it to update a UI. So below at the bottom is our UI and our numbers are one, two, and three above the flow. And let's watch them as they stream through our flow into the UI. The flow builder first emits its first value. This goes into the flow collector and the flow collector updates the UI. The second value comes through and again, goes to the flow collector, into the UI, and all values stream until eventually the flow closes and the coroutine ends. This all happened in one coroutine. In fact, this is why the coroutine was really under the disguise of flow. It was one resource. And once it was done operating through the list with that for each loop, the flow closed. It's very efficient, it's very safe, it's very easy to use. But flow actually comes in many more forms. For example, let's say we wanted a buffered flow, which is when a flow can hold on to values before the collector actually receives those values. We can do this simply by referencing our numbers in our coroutine and appending a buffer in between numbers and the collect operator. And what this does is it actually inserts a channel in between two coroutines, with one coroutine being the original collect coroutine, but the flow builder being a new separate coroutine. By doing this, the buffer channel allows the flow to be buffered and behave just like our old flow, except with the buffer in the middle. So we've seen now flows as a buffer channel. But let's look at that list again. We could actually write this more simply as list of one, two, three as flow. We could call it the same way that we did before with numbers.collect and it operates the exact same way. We can go even simpler and say flow of one, two, three. We could even make something like a functional type, a flow. We can make a suspending functional type, a flow. We can even make a live data object as flow. Anything can be flow. So let's put this all together with an Android app demonstration. So first we'll go over the recommended architecture. I wanna make sure that when I demonstrate how to use flow in an application, that it's in a modern application with some of the architecture components that you'll see in most apps nowadays. So first we have the view. This represents the activity or fragment. And we have the view model. So these two share data. Specifically, the view observes the live data within the view model. On the other side of our architecture, we have a data source and repository. The data source represents things like network calls and database reads. These are all captured in the data source, whereas the repository performs common operations on the data source. Both of these use a flow to represent the stream of data that comes out of them. Now, often applications will actually connect the view model directly to the repository. But to break out the business logic, we can use a use case to connect a view model to the repository between live data and flow using another flow. So here's an example app. We have a stream of users populating a list view. So let's go into how I built this. First, let's go into the models. There's a user, which you can see a list of on the left. A user has a name and a photo. And a photo is something I created. It simply just has a name and a drawable image. And the idea here is that users and photos are associated by name. Now, normally you might do this with a UUID or a GUID, but in this case, I wanted to keep it simple. Users and photos share the same name. So let's look at the data source. A data source is powered by a flow. And we normally represent this with room or retrofit if we want to do database calls with room and retrofit for network calls. But I wanted to keep it really simple. So let's look at an in-memory database called names. It's a flow generated from a list of Sarah, Nathan, Emily, and Alex. And the way we make that flow is using the as flow operator. So for example, room actually has support for flow. So you can actually make your data sources produce flows pretty easily with little work. But in this case, I wanted just to show a simple example of a source of data, these names. 
In our repository, we will work with that flow. So this is where we have our common operations. And right now we'll make a photo repository using the names we had from our data source. Let's create a flow of photos. First, we'll get names from our data source. And we will get each photo from that flow of names using the map operator. Now, in the demo, you did see me use this function, but it operated very quickly. So I wanted to slow it down so you could see the stream of values come in. Another operator we can use to do that is the on each operator. I used on each to delay the emission of users. But let's say you don't want your flow to run in the main thread. You can use the flow on operator to run your flow in a different set of threads, such as the default dispatcher set of CPU optimized threads. So let's keep going up. Let's go into the use case. I have a flow of photos and a flow of names now, but I want a flow of users from that. And the way I can do that to implement that business logic is to first get names and bring this together with the photos that we had from the photo flow. We can use the zip operator for this. Specifically, we'll zip names and the flow of photos, bringing a flow of names and photos that we can then use to create a flow of users by constructing a user in the zip operator. And now we have a use case with repository and names where we get a user flow. So now let's work our way up to the view model. Now we have live data. We need to convert that flow into a live data object. And fortunately, when we have the use case, that's actually very simple. To make that live data object of users, all we have to do is get the user flow from the use case and call as live data. And that's it, you're done. You have a live data object based on your flow. Finally, we'll work up to the view. Now, our job in the view is to observe the live data. So in, in whatever your creation method is, in this case, we probably have an activity. So in on create, we'll create a repository use case view model, all of the things that we need to create a list view. And then we'll reference our user live data and observe all of the users that come through that stream. And whenever we get a user, we simply add that user to our list adapter. And that's it. That's all you need to create that application. But you can actually build that with flow going all the way from the data source up to the view. We don't have to even use live data. For example, we could use the lifecycle scope with a custom coroutine builder called launch when created and use that to collect the users from our user flow. And as each user is collected, it can be added to the adapter, just like we saw with the live data object. Now, the reason this is possible is because flow is actually reactive. As the collect operator is running, it will suspend when there are no values and resume when there are new values. We can even use flow to write this even more cleanly. For example, we can use the launch and operator to remove a nesting level from this code. We can add on each to our user flow, describe what we'll do, specifically add the user, it in this case, and then launch in the lifecycle scope. And that's it. We have three ways to use flow in our flow of users application. So thank you for listening. I hope this was insightful.